Supporting type NM cable, or what most of us call Romex, is a subject that I get a lot of questions about. Do we staple at four inches, eight inches, or even 12 inches from a box? Is it measured in distance, or is it measured in cable length? What about supporting horizontal and vertical runs? And can we leave a service loop? There's even some confusion among electricians because of an additional requirement in another part of the code that's often overlooked. So in this video, I'm gonna go over everything you need to know about the subject so you get it right the first time on your next project. Hey guys, John here from Backyard Maine. I've been an electrician for 40 years and I know that code requirements are often a subject of debate and misunderstanding. So let's just jump right into it and solve the mystery together. Article 33430 in the National Electrical Code is where we look to find the requirements for type NM and NMC cable. This also covers NM-B, which you'll see on the packaging and labeling for Romex. The B simply means that the conductors inside the cable are rated for 90 degrees C, but remember their opacity is still taken from the 60 degree column in the code. If we scroll down to 334-30, we'll find the section on securing and supporting. It states that non-metallic sheath cables shall be supported and secured by staples, cable ties listed and identified for securement and support, straps, hangers, or similar fittings designed and installed so as not to damage the cable. Staples are the most common, but this tells us that there's other approved methods as well and that we need to install them in a way that won't damage our cable. So we want our cables and supports to be snug, but not tight enough to damage our cable. It then reads support at intervals not exceeding four and a half feet and within 12 inches of every cable entry into enclosures such as outlet boxes, junction boxes, cabinets, or fittings. So that's it, right? Every four and a half feet and within 12 inches of a box. But this is where we get into trouble. We read this and we think we have the answer, but there's another section in the code with an additional requirement. We'll take a look at that in a minute. But first, let's finish looking at 334.30. If we continue reading, it says that the cable length between the cable entry and the closest cable support shall not exceed 18 inches. So, in this example, if we place a staple at 12 inches from the box, the maximum cable length between that staple and the box cannot exceed 18 inches. If we are planning to leave a service loop or a little extra cable here in this example, it could not exceed 6 inches. 12 inches between the staple and the box, and six inches of slack. If we stapled 10 inches from the box, we could leave eight inches of slack for a maximum of 18 inches. This box has a staple within 12 inches and within 18 inches of cable length. But guess what? It's a code violation. I'll show you why in a second, but first, let's take a look at 33430A, horizontal runs through holes and notches. Here, it tells us that cable runs through holes and notches not exceeding four and a half feet will not need additional support. The hole or notch is sufficient support. So where we run our cable through holes and studs, we don't need additional support. Vertical runs will still need to be supported every four and a half feet. Article 33430B, Unsupported Cables, details two circumstances where cable supports are not required. First, we don't need supports if the cable is fished between access points through concealed spaces in finished buildings or structures. So if we want to extend a circuit, we could fish a wire into a finished wall or ceiling without any additional support. And second, we can have an unsupported cable up to four and a half feet away from a light or other piece of equipment when installed in an accessible ceiling. So let's get back to why this box is a code violation. It depends on the type of box being used. So let's take a look at some boxes to understand why that would make a difference. But first, take a look at this awesome new adjustable desk I have from FlexiSpot, the sponsor of today's video. I was looking for a standing desk for the shop because I think better and I'm more creative when I'm on my feet. I wanted something heavy duty, adjustable, but also easy to move around. I decided to go with this E7 Plus four leg standing desk by FlexiSpot and I love it. 
A standing desk that doubles as a workbench was perfect for me out here in the shop. And with its intuitive controller, it's very user friendly. You can set up to four height presets or you can manually move the desk up and down with the up and down arrow keys. They have lots of accessories to choose from. I opted for the solid wood top and the casters for moving it around. I like that it's heavy duty and it doesn't wobble while I'm working or while I'm recording. It's rated for 540 pounds of static weight and 440 pounds of lifting capacity, so strength is not going to be an issue. And this E7 Plus four-leg standing desk is very reasonably priced for the quality of what you get. FlexiSpot is offering some amazing sales right now too, so don't miss out. They provide all kinds of standing desks to meet your needs. If you want rock solid stability, then this E7 Plus is your top choice. If you want a premium standing desk for daily use, check out their E7 or E7 Pro C frame. If you're on a limited budget, you can choose their E5 model. Unlock more savings by using the exclusive promo code provided in the description. Just click the FlexiSpot link and enjoy these fantastic discounts while they last. Okay, let's get back to our boxes here and we'll talk about why some boxes have a different requirement than others. Our first five boxes here have something in common. This first one here is a pancake box and you'll notice it has knockouts in it and I have a half inch Romex connector in there. This Romex connector is considered a cable clamp. So this box has a cable clamp. Next we have our old work boxes. These have the little wings where you'd cut a hole in your drywall and put the box in and fish a wire down into it. These old work boxes have cable clamps in them. This is also an old work box, a two gang, that has also cable clamps. Now we have a two gang outlet or switch box here. It's a nail on box. Guess what? It also has these cable clamps in there. And then we have this round box used for light fixtures or maybe smoke detectors. Also, cable clamps. Then our last two boxes here, one of them is a little bit deeper than the other one, but they're both nail-on plastic boxes or considered non-metallic boxes. And you'll notice these just have, this one's knocked out, these just have holes in them that you knock out and put the cable in. So there is no cable clamp. The, the cable is just free floating in these boxes. This one hasn't had any knocked out yet, but the same deal. The cable just goes through one of these holes here and is not clamped to the box at all. Now this box behind me, this blue one, I think I got another one right here. I do. This is a little different. It has this little tab here sticking out that you can mount onto the side of the stud. These are handy sometimes. I like them. But again, it's a non-metallic plastic box with no cable clamps. So these five boxes here all have cable clamps and these three don't. Let's take a look at the code book and see why that makes a difference. This time we'll look at article 31417B2. It states, where cable with non-metallic sheaths are used, the sheath shall extend not less than a quarter inch inside the box or beyond the cable clamp and that the wiring method shall be secured to the box or conduit body. This is telling us that our cable needs to be secured to the box with a cable clamp. But then there's an exception that reads, where non-metallic sheathed cable is used with single gang non-metallic boxes, not larger than two and a quarter by four inches, mounted in walls and ceilings, and where the cable is fastened within eight inches of the box, measured along the sheath, and where the sheath extends through the cable knockout not less than a quarter inch, securing the cable to the box shall not be required. I know that's a pretty big mouthful of information there, but what it's telling us is that we can use certain boxes without cable clamps, but in order to do so, the cable needs to be supported within eight inches of the box. And since it's measured in cable length, leaving a service loop is not going to be possible. So our single gang plastic box with no clamp will need a support within eight inches of the box rather than the 12 inches listed in article 33430. 
I have two other bonus Romex tips that I'm going to share with you right now. First, the code allows multiple cable entries into a single cable knockout. So yes, we can run more than one cable through the same opening. Also, on the back of the box of staples, you'll see a listing of the size and number of cables allowed under each staple. This blue staple, which is one inch long by a half inch wide, is listed for just one cable of various sizes. This red staple, which is one and a half inch long by a half inch wide, is listed for two cables of various sizes. Article 1103B states that equipment that is listed and labeled or both shall be installed and used in accordance with any instructions included with the listing and labeling. So we do need to follow the manufacturer's instructions. In summary, supports are required within eight inches of single gang non-metallic boxes without cable clamps and within eight inches of total wire length between the support and the box. Also, within 12 inches of a box with cable clamps and within a total of 18 inches of cable length between the support and the box. And then every four and a half feet thereafter. If you want to learn more about electrical code requirements, I'll link a couple videos right here for you to watch next. Remember to check out the FlexiSpot link down in the description. I'm John from Backyard, Maine. I'll see you on the next one.